Hello and welcome to CSSC Encounters. Today we have a seminar on the topic of music making in Tibetan Buddhist communities. And our guest today is Quilan Liu, who is a uh, doctoral uh, uh, candidate at Harvard University, but also spending some time with us at uh, CSSC as a, a visiting scholar. Uh, Quilan is also a uh, documentary filmmaker and uh, interested uh, in more than just uh, Tibetan Buddhism, I understand. Uh, also indigenous uh, culture in general is one of her interests. Uh, but my opening question is, uh, how come that uh, a person who doesn't come from that part of uh, China, uh, from Wuhan I understand, uh, uh, has an interest in that part uh, being Tibet? Um. So, this Buddhist musical tradition has attracted increasing attention recently, and especially the very peaceful Buddhist um, chantings has been used in many spiritual healing process uh, therapies, and also a lot of uh, quite a few Buddhist choirs were formed to promote Buddhist teachings through music. Um, but few people has never really questioned um, the legitimacy of music making by monastic members or can Buddhist monks and nuns, can they really make music? Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, I was also um, attracted by this vibrant chanting traditions in northeastern Tibet where I was doing my field work. But then when I started to read the Buddhist monastic code, and then I realized that there's a question, there's a problem or an apparent contradiction because according to the Buddhist monastic code, monks and nuns are not supposed to make music. Um, no, that's indeed the case in other parts of the Buddhist uh, cultural environment. So what makes uh, Tibetan Buddhism so uh, specific, so special? Um, I think um, when people think about Buddhism, they usually they might have some um, generalized conceptions about what a Buddhist should mm -hmm. do. But quite often, they, the Tibetan Buddhists will surprise them. For example, one example is food. Um, I guess a lot of people would um, intend to believe that as Buddhist practitioners, especially Buddhist monks and nuns, you are supposed to be a vegetarian. You're not supposed to eat meat. Mm -hmm. um, that is very true um, for people who are practicing Japanese and Chinese Buddhism. But in Tibet, because of the high attitude, it is almost impossible to grow or to buy any vegetable. So in that situation, you have, you know, if you want to survive, you, you do have to um, eat meat. So right, so it's yeah. determined by the circumstances. That's true. Yeah. But uh, in the religion itself, there are also differences, right? Uh, like the, the tradition of lamas, uh, which uh, obviously is not uh, there in, in, in other uh, Buddhist traditions, Thailand, Japan, etc. So wha where does this come from? <laughs> um, so you mean, um, I guess, within the system of the Buddhist traditions, mm -hmm. of course, we do have uh, regional differences. For example, as you have mentioned, um, there are some specific traditions that are practiced in Tibet, but these are not practiced in other places like China, Japan, or Thailand, right. or any other South Asian countries. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, um, this, you know, these exceptions or peculiarities about Tibetan Buddhism has um, I guess it has a root in a very important theory in the Buddhist law system. For example, like for anything a Buddhist member has done in the Buddhist context, their act will be judged on four conditions. Um, in Tibetan, they are called Shi Sam Jowa Tatu, which is uh, Shi is the foundation, and Sam is the intention, and Jowa is the means through which you are doing this, and tattoo is the result. So for anything that is practiced, that is being practiced in Tibetan Buddhism, or this, uh, this rule also applies to um, the Buddhist traditions in other uh -huh. uh, geographical locations. Right. So um, if you just, you know, look at the service, some of the, you know, practices might be regarded as a exception or violation, but if you look deeper, as I will be, in, you know, talk more in my right. um, presentation afterwards, you will know that all these exceptions or, you know, violations, you know, these apparent violations could be explained in the Buddhist context. 
Okay, then why don't we go and um, uh, go to that presentation? Uh, because uh, after all, uh, Tibet and Tibetan Buddhism seems to be yeah, quite interest, uh, interesting and also uh, get a lot of interest from uh, uh, not only Buddhist societies but also non-Buddhist uh, non uh, environments like uh, people living in this part of the world. And uh, that, might, uh, uh, that question might be answered at the end of your presentation, uh, as, as far as I understand. So please give us uh, an uh, introduction in music making in Tibetan Buddhist communities. Okay, thank you, yeah. Um, so the enormous use of music in contemporary Buddhist practice seems to suggest that music plays a very important role and has a wide range of applications in the Buddhist traditions. Um, but if you look into the Buddhist monastic code, music is viewed with a very mixed feelings. So um, depending on the way in which it is performed and the application of its, you know, the purpose of its application, the use of music could either function to facilitate or to impede the religious practices. So, um, um, in my presentation, um, I would first provide a, a brief survey of the practice of music by monastic members in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and then I will introduce an old um, Buddhist chanting tradition from northeastern Tibet to supplement my discussion. Um, and having looked at co the contemporary Buddhist practice and its historical context in which it is practiced, I will then um, turn to the very old Buddhist monastic code, which were claimed to be written at the time of the Buddha, and to see whether monks and nuns are really allowed it to make music or not. Um, and by music, you mean uh, singing plus uh, playing an instrument, right? It's very complicated, okay. and I'm going to explain that in a few minutes. Um, okay, so. <coughs> The development of Buddhist, uh, the, the development of musical practice has been nourished in many ways, in various ways in the um, in Tibetan Buddhism. So, besides um, translations of Indian musical theories, the Tibetan scholars also themselves they also composed um, indigenous writings about music theory. For example, one of the most influential works is written by a 12th century Tibetan scholar Sakyabandita. It's titled, it, it is titled The Treatise on Music. Um, besides that, the Tibetan people also invented um, a, graphical, a graphic notation system to um, record and instruct reciting and chanting in order to reproduce them with precision and consistency. I have a picture of how a Tibetan Yang Yik looks like. Um, this is the way that music, especially monastic music, will be recorded in the Tibetan, in the practice of Tibetan Buddhism. So, you know, this, with this notation, with this graphical notation system, they will be able to reproduce the, the, rem uh, the religious chanting and reciting in the same way every time they repeat it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, the embracing of music in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition is also reflected in the introduction of a specific singing a very unique tradition in Tibet, which is uh, the Gur. Um, in, in this tradition, so the, the lyrics are often composed by um, yogis who are, re you know, who are meditating or re uh, practicing on, on the top of mountains or eminent monks. And usually the lyrics are elaboration of Dhamma views or expression of their personal experiences acquired through religious practices. Um, we have, so in this tradition has survived through the enormous um, song collections or guru collections written by Tibetan Buddhist masters. For example, like three of the most important ones are, like the first one is Melareba. He's a um, 11th century yogin from central Tibet. There are so many movies about Melareba and a recent one is uh, directed by uh, Nathan Chirkling, and you should be able to get a copy of this movie easily. And it has been played in the um, cinemas in Boston. What's um, the title of it? Ago. It's Melariba. Melariba. Yeah. 
it's a very, I promise you, it's, a, it's worth uh, checking out. And the second important um, master for this Gur singing tradition is a, um, a 17th century Geluba monk from northeastern Tibet. So just remember, he's a monk. He's not a yogi. Um, the third one is also from northeastern Tibet. His name is Chodron Ranjo, and he's a Ngagpa. And what's the difference between yogi, monk, and Ngagpa? I'm going to right. show you a picture. Um, so this is a great contrast. I took this photo um, three years ago in Amdo in northeastern Tibet. Um, so the one um, in the front is a Ngagpa, and the, the one behind him who is helping him with his clothes is a, a monk. So first, a Ngagpa will have hair. He will have his hair, but a monk, you must, as a monk, you must cut your hair very short. Mm -hmm. And also, the Ngagpa is usually wearing a different outer robe. The monk's outer robe will, will, will also be red, but for the Ngagpa, his robe is like um, white with a red uh, edge. And also, a monk must stay, uh, remain in celibacy. He cannot get married, usually. <laughs> and, but a Ngagpa, can get married, have a wife, he could also have children, and also a, a monk must stay in the monastery, but a Ngagpa, he can um, stay at home with his family and children for most of the time of the year. Um, when there are some special um, religious ceremonies, he will come to the monastery and perform the rituals. So these are the major differences between, you know, yogi, monk, and Ngakpa. So and in this how did they evolve as uh, differences? Uh, was that uh, as a result of uh, harsh living conditions or uh, uh, based on the scriptures, on the Buddhist uh, uh, religious uh, advice? Um, for the origin, I, I don't have a very clear clue at this point, but um, this Ngakpa tradition is, f is especially popular in northeastern Tibet, mm -hmm. where I am doing my field work. Um, one of the explanation is um, because once you decided to become a monk, you're not supposed to um, stay at home, and then this may, if a large number of male in the community decided to become a monk and you know stay in the monastery, this might bring some practical issues, mm -hmm. and for this reason. This Ngagbas in northeastern Tibet has become a very popular tradition. So they can, you know, be a religious member of the mon monastery while they can still perform some of their responsibilities as a household right. husband, man in the family. Um, so in present day, so these are the um, some historical, um, some introductions about the historic, uh, the practice of, uh, of religious music in history in Tibet. Present, in present day, the monks, especially the, the Buddhist monks and nuns, they also have very convenient access to songs, rento, CD, and other musical products. Personally, I've never seen any monks or nuns who have been scolded or, you know, um, blamed by their masters for listening to sounds, even if what they're listening to are not, you know, religious teachings, but instead they're listening to popular sounds. It's okay. Um, in particular, in some monasteries, um, reciting and chanting has been have been institutionalized as a very important part of their monastic education. Um, nowadays, you know, even like we also have some monastic individuals who have become professional singers, and I have some examples here. Uh, the one to the upper left is a Tibetan Buddhist nun. Her name is Chein Joma, and she was born in Nepal. And at the age of 13, she was accepted into a nunnery where she studied chanting and other religious music. Um, her Musical talent was first discovered by an American guitarist with whom she later collaborated at CD. And since then she has been um, she has been recognized as an accomplished monastic artist since then. Um, the one to the um, lower left is called Bema Chupe. He was also born in Nepal. Um, in 2001, he released a CD in Taiwan and that CD won a big music award in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, I also have like two short sample clips and maybe you can get a better idea of how their chanting sounds like. Yeah, why not? Om 
तारे तू तारे तुरे सो हो तारे तू तारे तुरे सो ओम तारे तू तारे तुरे सो Okay, so this is the chanting by Ani Chuyin Zhoma, the Tibetan Buddhist nun from Nepal, and I also have another clip from Pema Chupe. <laughs> So both um, the, the clips that I showed here from um, the Tibetan Buddhist nun uh, Chuyin Joma and Bema uh, Chepe are religious chanting. So these are not seen in my definition. Mm -hmm. But this, um, the two um, photos that I have here um, to the right are more or less controversial figures. The one to the upper right, he is a very skillful player of the plucking instrument that is very popular in Amdo. And he's also a husband and a father. And you, as you can see, he, has, he also has long hairs, but later he shaved them. The one in the lower right is more controversial because um, his name is Singa, who claimed himself to be a reincarnated Tibetan Lama. And he's determined to promote Buddhist teachings through his music, which um, most of which are secular songs about love and life, not really you know, religious chanting or reciting. And he has also signed a contract with an entertainment company and became a professional singer. I will um, talk a little bit more about him later on as okay. a controversial figure in this tradition. So in addition to this historical figures and contemporary um, individual monastic musicians in the, uh, in the practice of Tibetan Buddhism, I also want to introduce um, a very old chanting tradition that is still in practice in northeastern Tibet. It's called Hornak Mani. So Mani is referring to the um, six-syllable mantra in, in the practice of Tibetan Buddhism, and Hornak is the name of a region, it's a geographical name. So in the, this Hornak Mani is an annual chanting festival. Um, usually it will start on the summer solstice and will last for eight up to 15 days depending on the size of the village. If it's a, you know, if the, in the biggest village they will have the festival for 15 days, but for the less, um, the smaller ones, they would only have it for eight days. Um, the chanting leaders are from um, a, a Tibetan Buddhist monastery called Rungwogun. There are less than 20 monks there. So these monks every year when the festival starts, the monks will be dispatched from this monastery to lead the chanting in eight surrounding villages. And I also have pictures of the monks. So this is a group photo of some of the monks from the um, monastery called Rungwogun. So altogether they have around 20 monks there. Um, and this is a map of, you know, to show the geographical location of this particular monastery. So to the lower right, we have a map of um, China. So the monastery is located in, is located in Qinghai province in China. Um, t it's located to the northeastern of central Tibet, Lhasa. And um, this is a, so on the upper left is a Google map. And you can, as you can see, like we have very few residential dorms and temples there in this monastery. Um, this is a real picture that I took in 2010. Um, so I on this map, we have the monastery, uh, Rongwogun Monastery, and we also have the um, eight villages. So every year when the festival starts, the monks from this monastery will travel from the monastery to lead the chantings in these eight villages. The traffic is, is extremely difficult and dangerous, and I, I got a ride. Um, so I got a ride from some monks in the monastery. We ride on a motorcycle, like the road is like this wide. It's really dangerous. You can, you can fort into the valley any time, any minute, any <laughs> moment. And later on, he told me that his brake is not working. <laughs> so a real adventure. Yeah. Uh, 
you need to be brave. <laughs> um, so traditionally, in this chanting festival, there will be like monks there will use 18, dif 18 different melodies. Most of these melodies are adopted from the folk melodies that are preserved in the villages. Um, at this moment, only monks from this particular small Rongwogun monastery are capable of singing all the 18 melodies. Um, the chanting text that they will be using in this festival are two song collections. One is written by the 17th century um, Tibetan Geluba monk from northeastern Tibet that I mentioned earlier. And the other one is the song collection of Milariba, the um, 11th century yogin from central Tibet. Um, so within eight or 15 days, the monks must finish chanting of you know this text. It's very thick, and also um, to the lower right we have a you have a w I have a picture of um, how the chanting text looks like. So each village will have one copy of the text, and during those um, eight to fifteen days, they must finish chanting all of them. Um, I also have a short video that I was able to make during my field trip. Um, so maybe you can get yeah. a better idea of how the festival looks like. On the high mountains of the Qinghai Tibetan Plateau, a small Buddhist monastery, Rongwogun, is cradled between the green valley and the blue sky. For centuries, monks in this monastery have been the treasure keeper of a Buddhist chanting tradition. Mani. Mani is referring to the six mantric syllables in Tibetan Buddhism. And Hornak is the name of a region covering nine villages. The Hornak village, located in the center, is the capital village of this region. Every year, on the summer solstice day, Alag Rungwogun, abbot of this monastery, will visit the central Hornak village. As a tradition, this visit marks the beginning of the annual money chanting festival. In each village, one or two monks from Rongwogun will lead the chanting. As the chanting leader, the monk will sing written lyrics from a manuscript. The villagers, mostly illiterate, will interact with the chanting leader by singing the six syllables. <laughs> Depending on the size of the village, the chanting may last from 8 up to 15 days. They may start on different days after the summer solstice, but they must all complete on the same day, or the 15th day from the solstice. On the last day, villagers in Nurong will throw a special party to celebrate. <laughs> As rewards, the villagers will offer various gifts to the chanting leaders. All the gifts will be loaded in trucks and it will be sent to the monastery for redistribution. A few days after the chanting festival is finished, the monks will then enter summer retreat for 45 days. The monastery will then be closed for visitors. In the entire valley, only its original residents will be allowed. The monks, a guard dog, singing birds perched on the trees, and moving clouds in the sky. Okay, so this is, is just a short video. To I guess maybe through this video you can be um, introduced in a better way. Because usually, like I, I, I personally find visual images are more powerful than words. Um, and then, so, so having looked at the contemporary um, practice of, of religious music in Tibetan Buddhism and also the historical traditions there, I want to turn to the 
serious stuff. And I will look at the Buddhist monastic code and you know, to, to dig into the rules and to see you know, how music is really regulated. Um, but before we start the discussion, there are a few things needs to be clarified first. For example, first, um, how many, so how do, how do we define music right. in the Buddhist context? For example, we have singing, chanting, and reciting. So what is music and how do you define them? What's the difference between them? And also, what are the, so in what ways can Buddhist members get involved? Do they perform or they teach as a teacher or they watch or they just, you know, as an observer? And also, um, how many Buddhist practitioners are there in Tibetan Buddhism? This is f these questions are very important because in the Buddhist uh, law system, when an act has happened, to in order to judge whether that act is uh, legitimate, appropriate or inappropriate, um, there will be very strict uh, procedures to, to make the judgment. So make clear distinguishings between you know, different genres of music, you know, different types of practitioners in, Tibetan, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition is very, is of fri primary importance. Um, so first, in the practice of Buddhism, how many kinds of music are there? Um, just for the purpose of my research, I um, categorized all of the musical activities into three categories. First, mm -hmm. vocal music second, instrumental music, and the third is musical performance, which um, incorporates singing, dancing, and drama, and some other related shows. Um, for vocal music, depending on the nature of its lyrics, it could be further divided into three subcategories. First, we have singing. So singing is folk melodies sung with lyrics narrating about secular life. And we also have reciting. So reciting is the Buddhist doctrinal texts recited in religious melodies. And thirdly, we also have chanting. So chanting are religious melodies sung with um, narratives, narratives composed by lay and monastic practitioners. So does that system work for you? or? So this is my system. I need to establish this system first to continue my research. And I personally, I found um, so far, this is the best way that I can work with it. Um, and in terms of the way in which the Buddhist practitioners can get involved in musical activities, basically there are three ways. And first, they could, as Buddhist monks or nuns, they could either perform, which is to sing songs or to play instrumental music or, or to perform drama by themselves in person as a, as a player mm -hmm. on the stage. Or they can function as a teacher to teach their musical skills to other interested person. And in, you will find many stories in the Buddhist monastic code where the, you know, some of the uh, monastic musicians will be asked to teach lay person to, to perform music. So this is a second way they can function as teachers. And also they, of course, they can just go out and to attend public musical shows. So these are the three ways of, uh, to participate in musical activities. This is also important because when a violation is suspected, it is very important to look at, you know, the ways in which the, the person in suspicion has has uh, involved himself in the act. So it is of primary, primary importance to distinguish the three different w uh, ways of uh, involvement. Yeah, but if I may, uh, ch chanting, by my understanding, mm -hmm. is uh, also acceptable in other Buddhist traditions, mm -hmm. but it's normally uh, praying in a rhythmic way, which mm -hmm. may sound like music to some people's ears, mm -hmm. uh, but that's one of the basic uh, uh, forms of, uh, of uh, yeah, praying, as I already used the term, while uh, the step beyond there uh, mm -hmm. is obviously uh, going more in direction of a, melodi a melodic kind of uh, 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 chanting, which then uh, goes into music, uh, singing, right? So uh, can you distinguish all these different levels uh, in 
uh, your observations? So in my research, the, the most important criteria that I looked at is to look at its lyrics. So what mm. are you think, what are you um, what are you s praising about? Are you praising of the how beautiful secular life is and mm -hmm. how we, you know how I want to get a to encounter a beautiful girl and get a family and that's absolutely secular singing as you've mentioned so chanting and reciting if your text the the content of your singing are religious about religious teaching or about dhammas yeah. or about how to become a good person religious person that's absolutely acceptable and I will um, introduce like the monastic rules regarding these different kinds of um, musical activities mm -hmm. too. Um, so another issue that we have to clarify in this research is how many kinds of Buddhist practitioners are there in the Buddhist traditions? So altogether we have, uh, we have seven, seven different kinds of Buddhist practitioners. Um, just to make the list shorter, we can put them into three uh, into four categories. So the first is Buddhist laymen and mm -hmm. laywomen, and the second is novices, and the third is female religious student, and the fourth one is um, fully ordained monks and nuns. Um, so these various kinds of Buddhist practitioners are defined by the number and the content of the vows that they take, the precepts that they take to observe. For example, for the Buddhist laymen and laywomen, they can take from one up to five precepts. So you can take one or two or three or five. De you know, it, tot it you know depends on you. So these five precepts for the Buddhist laymen and laywomen would require them to refrain from taking life, take what it, taking what is not given, which is like theft, and also stealing. Yeah, yeah stealing. <laughs> um, it will also um, advise them to refrain from sexual misconduct or to give forced speech or to drink alcohol. For the novices, they must, so for the novices, it's not optional, you must take 10 precepts. So in addition to the five precepts for the Buddhist laymen and laywomen, they are also required um, to refrain from taking food at an inappropriate time. For example, you're not supposed to eat at 12 o'clock ni at night. Um, you should also refrain from, from singing, dancing, or attending musical shows. Um, you should also refrain from wearing perfume, cosmetics, and garlands, and um, refrain from sitting on high chairs and mm -hmm. soft beds, and as well as to refrain from taking gold or silver. So these are precepts for the Buddhist laymen and laywomen and the novices. And now, up to this point, there's no difference between male and female practitioners. But if a male novice wants to become an, uh, a monk, to be fully ordained as a monk, he can do so after he has successfully completed his novice training. But for a female novice, she must enter, um, she must spend two more years as a religious student to observe six uh, additional major precepts and six additional minor precepts after she has completed her novice training. And before that two years of training, she cannot be ordained as a nun. And this is a, a, s a signif significant difference between male and female practitioners in the Buddhist tradition. And for the Fourth category, the fully ordained monks and nuns. It's very difficult to be a monk. You, I'm, I'm talking about, um, specifically, I'm talking about uh, the practice in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition because in different traditions, the number of precepts di differ from each other. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, a monk will be required to observe 253 precepts, a nun is required to observe 364 precepts. Why is it tougher on women? <laughs> well, this has been, actually, the researches on Buddhist nuns has become a very hard topic in the study of Buddhism. Um, many people have studied, um, you know, this gender difference between nun and monks. Um, I'm not a specialist on, you know, gender studies, but um, from what I have read from the Buddhist monastic codes, actually a lot of the 
extra precepts for nuns are made just because of the differences between a male and a female. For example, um, many precepts for the nuns are specifically only applicable to nuns as because you are a female. So, for example, um, a Buddhist nun cannot um, walk on the way by yourself because you might endanger yourself if somebody, you know, approach you like some um, unwanted things may happen. But as a Buddhist monk, you because because you are you are a male, so you don't have that kind of problem. So actually, a lot of the extra precepts for Buddhist nuns are made because they are female. So I I don't I don't. Personally, feel that these precepts are like discriminations, or female requires more precepts to behave better. Yeah, I I do see there's a reason behind those extra precepts. Okay, so as it is impossible to name all the to introduce all the precepts here, I would just focus on some of the precepts that are related with uh, the practice of right. music. Um. So. In the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist men, Buddhist laymen and laywomen are actually, they can make music if it, is intend, if it is intended for a religious purpose. And usually, actually, they are encouraged to do so because once Buddha told, said to a king in ancient India, he said, um, offerings of incense, clothes, food, and music must be made in order to um, benefit the world and also in order to benefit the sentient beings. So it is important and necessary for lay Buddhists to make musical offerings. But if the, you know, if the music is not produced for a religious purpose, a good Buddhist layman or laywoman should refrain herself from excessive engagement in musical activities because Addiction to such musical entertainments may lead to financial losses. Um, so for the novice, the second category, they are clearly required by one of the ten precepts to uh, refrain from singing, dancing, or attending musical shows. So this is clearly written down. No negotiations. So for the Buddhist monks and nuns, first, so in my um, um, categorization, first, vocal music, Singing is absolutely prohibited by to be performed or taught or watched by Buddhist monks and nuns. There's no exception, okay? And, but, so in the category of vocal music, besides singing, we also have reciting and chanting. So for reciting and chanting, monks and nuns can perform reciting and chanting. And indeed, in some monasteries, reci the reciting and chanting has become institutionalized as part of the monastic education. Mm -hmm. But some s restrictions will apply to the performance of reciting and chanting. For example, an ugly person or a handicapped person should not be appointed as a chanting leader. Um, and also, two monks or nuns are not supposed to chant together because like one might recite or chant a little bit faster the other one will do it slower and this would be you know regarded as a kind of like embarrassing embarrassing thing so you're not supposed to do that um, for instrumental music um, this is also absolutely for forbidden to be performed by monks or nuns um, in extreme occasions you know if there's a musical instrument there I don't play it Nobody is playing. I'm, you know, if a Buddhist monk or nun, they touch the instrument, that would also constitute an infringement. So in extreme cases, um, for musical performances with dancing and singing, they the Buddhist so the Buddhist monks and nuns are, are forbidden to go to watch, to sing, or to perform. But again, we also have again we have exceptions. Um, if there's musical performance at a grand religious ceremony in the monastery. Or for example, like people are celebrating Buddha's birthday in a monastery and there's a musical show. It's okay. As Buddhist monks, you can also, you can also go there and, and sit there and listen to the music. Or um, 
if you are working, if you are traveling to some place, and on your way to that place, there is a musical show being performed there. It is okay. So in those occasions, your act will not be, uh, even if you have listened to the music, it is not considered as a violation. So these are some exceptions. Um, okay, so having said that, why, so we looked at the, you know, the precepts in the Buddhist monastic code that are used to regulate the practice of music by Buddhist monastic members. So why on earth is music condemned in Buddhist monastic code? Why? Um, I guess first, the nature of music is really complex and its function in the Buddhist practice is dependent of the way in which you perform it, the, the way in which it is performed, and also why you are performing this. So when, when music is used properly, the merit of music making as offerings, as religious offerings, would um, help you to accumulate merits, and also it will also help you to reach enlightenment immediately. But if music is misused, it could also you know, become obstacles to um, hinder or to impede your religious practices. For example, um, I get so in my research, I found that um, there are three factors that has contributed to the contamination of music in the Buddhist traditions. So the first factor is um, spiritual. On their path to spiritual um, accomplishments, one of the major obstacles the Buddhist men and women have been battling against is uh, is attachment. So music is very sweet in nature and also it's very pleasant to hear. So for the unexperienced practitioners, um, you know, if, if, if they are allowed to listen to music or to perform music, they could be easily distracted because their minds has, have not been tamed to resist worldly enjoyments. So this is one of the major um, spiritual reasons. Um, and also, we also, so one example is that we found one example in the Buddhist text. It says that once a group of nuns, they went to a musical show and they went to listen to um, singing and also they watched uh, dancing. Having returned to the nunnery and some of them became so attached to the music and their face to Dharma diminished. And eventually, a few of them decided that they would like to give up their vow and be converted as a non-Buddhist. So this is a serious problem. But of course, this is an ex extreme example here. Um, the second factor is economic. Because as we know, in the Buddhist traditions, either in its home, India, or um, in China, Tibet, or Japan, once you decided to become a monk or nun, you are no longer in possession of money. And a practical result of that is, if you go to the public musical shows, you will be unable to tip the performers. And these performers are depend, you know, they depend on the, the tips that they will collect at the end of the show to make a living. So if a lot of seats are taken by Buddhist monastic, you know, Buddhist monks and nuns, the performers will complain. And indeed, they did complain in the Buddhist text. We do have stories about, you know, monks and nuns went to musical shows and then the performers would complain, you know, they took the best seats and we are unable to make a living. <laughs> so this is a very practical economic reason. And also uh, one example for the, com you know, why, for why music is condemned is also, is also because when music is misused by monastic members, um, they could also bring like um, difficulties for the mm -hmm. um, Buddhist community. For example, uh, once two monks, they, um, they resided in a, a lay community called uh, Black Mountain, that's the name of the community. So they, uh, together with the lay women, they sing songs, they danced, and they performed various other secular activities with the women. And as a, as a result, they corrupted the ladies. So the people in that community lost their faith in the Buddhist practitioners. And then for the future monks, for the other monks who came to, uh, to get alms from that community, it, it became extremely difficult. 
nobody could get any arms or offerings from that community. So this is another practical right. reason. Yeah. And also, the third reason against the use of music by monastic members is, um, according to my research, I found that the lay, the lay community has a perception about a boundary that divides the monastic community and the lay community. So music is considered as a secular, and musical activities are considered by the Buddhist, by the lay communities as, you know, lay only activities. And one of, so in a lot of stories in the Buddhist monastic code, one of the frequently used criticism is as, as, lay, as lay people, as laymen and women, we do acts. If Buddhist monks and nuns also do acts, what makes them different from us? So from here we can see like, you know, there is an expectation in the lay community that as Buddhist monks and nuns, you should behave different than us. If we are both doing the same thing, what makes you different from us? Mm -hmm. So this is a third reason for why so music is condemned. You should not cross borders. Yes. <laughs> Um, so that said, I guess some of you may question if you are concluding that music is condemned in the, you know, by the Buddhist monastic code, why the practice of music is allowed in the Tibetan Buddhist communities and especially such grand annual chanting festival is allowed. It. Um, first of all, well, I want to mention that even today, seeing especially secular scene, like the two controversial figures to the right, because they have families and also they uh, became professional singers and their songs were about secular life and about love and, and life. So this kind of scene by monastic members are still not accepted in the Buddhist community, even in Tibet. Um, for example, the, the, the person to the lower right, he's a very fashionable person. So he um, has a lot of um, photos in which he dressed like a fashionable mo model. And also he sung a lot of popular songs. So he has, been, he has not been accepted by the authoritative lamas in his own lineage. So secular singing is still not accepted. But the kind of um, s uh, religious uh, musical tradition that I mentioned in my presentation today in the Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhism, they are religious singing intended for religious purposes, so they are acceptable. Um, and the second, um, the second reason why music practice is acceptable, is accepted in the Tibetan Buddhist community is, for example, for this Hornang Mani tradition, it's held once a year, and during those 15 years, every day, each of the household in the village will make various offerings to the monks. At the end of the um, annual festival, um, they will, they will, the monks will be able to collect like huge bread, <laughs> huge bread and also other, um, offer other gifts by mm -hmm. made by the villagers. And all the gifts will be then um, sent to the monastery and all the gifts will be redistributed among all the monks, regardless of their age or, the, or their religious status in the monastery. So, Every monk will get a share. So to lead, to be a leader in this chanting festival is also a very important source of it to make some income. Especially, for example, the bread that they have collected will be uh, then um, dry or and cut into pieces to save for the colder season. So in probably starting from, septem from September up to December, these monks will have to rely on this huge dried bread to survive in the colder season. Um, so, so this you know, economic concerns is another factor that make this annual chanting festival acceptable in this um, Bud Tibetan Buddhist community. And a third factor is because this annual um, chanting festival also function as an opportunity, provides an opportunity for the entire community to social and to strengthen their connection with each mm -hmm. other. For example, um, in the short video, as you have seen, at the end of the, um, towards the end of the celebration, the, um, the villagers will raise money 
and they will try to host a grand party to feed everybody and even the strangers passing by. So they will feed everybody and also they will, the women, especially, oh, there's a, okay. The entire village will be, decide, will be divided into male and female and they will throw barley flowers at each other to make fun of each other and also it's a great time to have fun with each other and also they are very, they are very busy working during the year and this is the time that they can relax and have fun and have some you know good times together and even for the monks after the chanting festival is finished they will um, spend 45 days in the monastery in for retreat but after they have finished their retreat some villagers in the village will invite them to come for a party at which they will be able to relax. And the monks will also hold an annual sports competition <laughs> among themselves. So we'll, they will have a lot of fun together. So, I mean, this, all of these reasons have contributed, I believe, have contributed right. to the fact that, you know, this musical practice has been accepted in the Tibetan communities. And also, they're not, you know, they are necessary and very important for people in the local communities. So, I guess um, this is just a very brief introduction to what's happening in the Tibetan communities about, you know, wh what is happening to the musical right. practice in this um, Tibetan communities, both in history and in the what is the contemporary situation and some of my personal observations from my research so far um, and that's it thank you <laughs> um, what i uh, uh the way i try to uh, to summarize your presentation is uh, fourfold on the one hand there are definitely contextual issues mm -hmm. which you have uh, addressed and referred to uh, historically speaking but also economic and other uh, ways there is obviously a, a, a difference uh, between the content and the, 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 the form of the music. So secular music content is not uh, preferred. The religious music content is, is, prefer or is uh, accepted. Uh, and then, of course, who performs all of this is definitely also a, a condition to assess when you talk about your music uh, in a Buddhist environment. Am I getting to yeah. <laughs> somewhere? Okay, that uh, indeed um, uh, is uh, different in other Buddhist cultural traditions. But we should open the, the floor now and invite uh, questions, uh, uh, which I'm sure uh, some of you may have. Um, thanks so much for your presentation. That was great. Um, I'm a musician and an educator, so I'm interested in um, like the youth attitudes towards um, this music that you've been talking about, um, particularly the distinction between secular and religious music. And what are the youth attitudes towards the religious music um, within the Tibetan Buddhist communities? Um, so you mean the younger peop generation? Yeah. Um, so in the in a very long period of time and the younger generations, I guess, the younger generations in the world, they are trying to catch up with the fashion, the new currents in the world. The Tibetans are no exceptions. So if you go to Tibet, you will see um, young people, even sometimes young monks and nuns. They have, um, okay, let me see. Actually, one lama, one Tibetan lama that I'm working with, he's using iPhone last year. I don't have an iPhone, but he's using an iPhone. And also my friends are asking me to bring iPads to them. So, the younger generations in Tibet, um, in the past, they seems to be running towards the word fashion, the word, car, you know, the the word trends. But now, um, many of them, especially the ones that has gone to college or the ones that were able to go out and see the outside world, and once they are out of their own community, they all of a sudden they realize, oh we are most valued for our traditional culture and we are treated as special guests because of the cultural heritage that we were able to preserve and as younger generations we have the responsibility to, to carry this tradition on why are we throwing this out and we are trying to become another person so in this um 
in this um, particular region in northeastern Tibet, that where I am working um, for my dissertation, um, actually, when I was filming this document, uh, filming this um, Honang Mani tradition last year, there's also a young Tibetan who was also he borrowed some cameras from uh, a foundation, and he we the two of us were filming together. He's actually now studying in Northampton, so. I guess for the younger generations in Tibet, they have become increasingly aware that their traditional cultures are really valuable and they have the responsibility to carry this tradition on. And um, some, um, some, t some young Tibetans have um, voluntarily um, founded some organizations or societies in order to um, bring together the monastic community and also they were trying to introduce traditional educations th that were um, maintained in the monastery and they were trying to um, raise public awareness of such traditional cultures in the, um, in the Tibetan community. So regarding the Tibetan, especially the t Tibetan musical tradition, I also know um, quite an accomplished Tibetan folk song singer. He is actually doing research on the um, monastic music in order to get inspiration for like for example like in the Horang Mani tra uh, chanting tradition we have 18 different melodies and all of them are beautiful so you know if you want to if you want to compose your original piece of music it you know you will be uh, it will be sub subjected to test of many people for a longer mm -hmm. for a very long period of time but these 18 melodies has have survived hundreds of years, and people are still, you know, enjoying them, and they still like them. So, for th for this, you know, artist, secular artist, they are also looking into the, you know, religious music, m religious Chinese tradition to get inspiration, to prepare for their new ovens or cities or something like that. Yeah, it it is it has been um, valued among the younger generations in Tibet as well. Okay, uh, more questions? Yes, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist by birth, so I'm from uh, another canon, which is called Hinayana Buddhism. So as a Hinayana uh, Buddhist, we are proud of having the, uh, what our, uh, uh, what's called Bible, according to what Buddha said. This is like the true uh, orthodox uh, Buddhist, exactly what Buddha said. So saying that this is the Buddhist monastic rules here and there, I think you should add the word Tibetan uh, Buddhist monastic rule because it's so different from what we have. For example, the monks, monks in, uh, in Hinayana Buddhism uh, adhere to 272 precepts and uh, fe uh, female nuns, 311. Mm -hmm. And we have so many forms of uh, lay men and lay women. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can adhere to precept 5 or precept 8. And the novice is 10. And then we cannot have a female monk at, at, that, at this moment because you to become a female monk, you must have a upacha or the teacher, professor who can ordain you, mm -hmm. and that person must be a female. But that female has uh, been in uh, extinction long ago, so we couldn't cross to the Mahayana, which is uh, Chinese, Japanese Buddhism, which is a bit of what we call a Protestant, out of from the Catholic from the Orthodox Buddhist. And we have you, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which is because you mix a lot of myth and miracles in, in that. So it's a very far deviant from, uh, from the pure form of Buddhism. So I'm not surprised to see the monk here sing or whatever. In Thailand, we have Thai Buddhism, which is mm -hmm. also different from what Buddha said. You have to look back into what Buddha said to see here is a tradition. So to be able to compare you can't just say, oh, here, this is uh, Tibetan Buddhism and this is the, their, their own uh, uh, you know, Bible. So it is already deviated quite a bit, quite a bit. So 
in in uh, yeah, monks in in Thailand can also uh, recite, but they they can't sing. So they are also different because we mixed also political uh, ideology in that. So if the monks play guitar or whatever, they will be disrobed by the police, for instance. That's that's we call localization of Buddhism, and and you can see that. <coughs> Better go back to the pure form of it and see how far it is from from what is being practiced. Just just a comment. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Pat, for your comments. I, I completely agree with you that there is a big gap between what is written down like hundreds or thousands of years ago about what a Buddhist monk should do and what is being practiced contemporarily. And also, so in my presentation, the, the rules, the precepts that I examined um, are taken from the Buddhist monastic codes that are nowadays preserved in second in languages like Chinese, Tibetan, Pali, and also fragmented Sanskrit manuscripts. So the precepts that I looked at are, as you have mentioned, are written, um, at least they are claimed to be written at the time of Buddha, which is like over 2,000 years ago. And in this huge, you know, with this huge gap in between, between the written codes and what we are practicing nowadays mm -hmm. today in either in Tibet, China, Thailand, or in Japan, or in Sri Lanka. Um, of course, we cannot simply just try to apply those rules that were written down like 2,000 2, years ago and apply those rules to what the Buddhist monks and nuns are doing nowadays. And this is also what I'm trying to figure out in my, doctor, um, in my doctoral research. Like, in the process of you know in the process of localization how how do tibetans um, either the lay scholars or monastic scholars how do they interpret the rules regarding music and you know wh like why why do they allow the practice of music in the Tibetan Buddhist traditions. So this is also what I'm trying to figure out in my research. I, I do agree with you. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Uh, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I have two questions, and maybe you'll choose one of them or okay. <laughs> answer them both. Um, one is to just ask about what led you to music in this context. I don't know if your field is musicology or ethnomusicology, um, but to describe the development of your field work and your connection with the communities uh, with whom you did your research. Mm -hmm. And the second question is you mentioned the 18 melodies that mm -hmm. have survived hundreds of years and that they're being very beautiful. And um, I don't doubt that they are, but it immediately made me wonder if you have inquired into what makes something beautiful, what makes a melody beautiful. Um, you may recognize it as beautiful, but have you talked with uh, the monks and nuns um, about what what beauty, what melodic beauty is in this context. Okay, so thanks for your question. Um, so first, um, when I'm doing this research, I'm not approaching as an ethnomusicologist, um, which means I don't analyze um, the musical aspects of the of the melodies, but instead I'm approaching this project from um, a perspective, of, you know, a, a, a textual perspective. So I am mainly working on the, um, first I'm working, I'm looking through all these Buddhist monastic codes and the contemporary musical traditions that are practiced in Tibet are being used as supplementary, uh, supplementary materials to, um, to test my theories or my hypotheses, and I don't want to like go off track too far. So whenever I feel that I am uncertain about some presumptions that I'm making in my textual studies, I will I will turn and I, I will try to apply them to the contemporary practice of religious music in Tibet and to see if I am, you know, in the right direction. Um, and also in terms of the 
the beauty, the, the beauty of the melodies themselves, actually like in, in my presentation, I mentioned um, the 12th century Tibetan scholar Shakyabhanida's treatise on music. Actually in that piece of work, he did talk about um, uh, the, mm, what kind of music are religious and what kind of music will be suitable for a religious purpose. So actually in that piece of work, he mentioned that for religious chanting and reciting, the, the, melody, the melody should be kept to minimum. And you should be focusing on the contents of the reciting and chanting, and which means you have to focus on the promotion of Buddhist ideas and try to limit the use of melody. So you should like your, your um, um, the rhythm, um, the pitches or the melodies should be as simple as possible. So in this context, um, the, the Buddhist, tra uh, the chanting tradition that I have mentioned in my, that I have examined in the presentation, actually some of, a lot of the 18 melodies are adopted from the folk melodies in the village that were used in the village. For example, the founder of this chanting tradition is called um, uh, Omo Lojang. Uh, he's, he, has a, he has a prefix, Omo. Omo is actually the village where he was born. So at his time, he actually he, uh, intentionally borrowed some of the melodies that he heard when he was a child in the village. And he used those beautiful melodies into this chanting tradition. So among those 18 melodies, many of them were borrowed, actually adopted from folk melodies. Um, personally, I, you know, I guess all the people that I met in that region, I never thought about asking the question whether, you know, do you think these melodies are beautiful or not? And they would, I would probably get an answer. If they're not beautiful, well, well we've seen them for hundreds of years. So, <laughs> yeah, does that answer a little bit of your question. <laughs> it's all a matter of interpretation, I would say. <laughs> but um, if no other questions emerge, then I would like to thank you for uh, enlightening us and thank you for your interest. Thank you. Thanks very much.